behalf of ICS and all of us here in computer science, I would like to take a brief moment to welcome you to the third annual industry showcase in ICS. This year, the list of um, corporate partners and attendees is really impressive. And um, we hope that this, uh, you will find this event both intellectually interesting and also um, sort of a big value to your company uh, mission and vision. Uh, I'm mostly speaking to our corporate partners, but uh, let me take this uh, moment to also offer my best wishes to students, faculty, staff who might be watching the video. So as you may know, the Department of Computer Science is the largest department in the School of Information and Computer Sciences. We have approximately 60 research faculty, a number of professors of teaching. Uh, we have uh, some 500, give or take, graduate students. Uh, about half of those are uh, doctoral students. We have postdocs. Uh, visitors, and so on and so forth. So it's a, it's a very large community of researchers. Um, this community is doing outstanding research in all um, aspects of computing, um, including AI, ML systems, um, big data, compilers, theory, and, and many other areas, uh, too many to list here. Um, so in the last decade, we have had uh, continuous year after year uh, faculty hires, we have had a lot of uh, student population growth. Um, and sort of as a result, we have an extremely um, active group of um, junior faculty and their students who are bringing an element of, of sort of um, sort of academically dynamic um, nature to the department. Um, and, and I'm, you know, not to mention sort of our senior distinguished faculty who are leaders in their um, broader sort of research community. So as a whole, we think this is all translating to first class education for our students, and hopefully they are uh, skilled better uh, for the kind of jobs that are in demand today. Um, let me also um, mention that um, the computer science is home to a number of degree programs, uh, the undergraduate computer science program, the computer science and engineering program, uh, the professional masters in computer science and data science. Uh, some of these are jointly with the School of, of Engineering or the Departments of Stats and Informatics. Um, but as a result, we are able to tailor the education and the, the student experience um, in, in, in a number of ways. And, and I think this sort of contributes to, again, preparing students for, for the kind of things that they might enjoy doing more and, and uh, of course, that might be in demand in industry. So with that, I one more time, let me thank you again for participating. And uh, I, I am looking forward to meet you um, at every opportunity um, that, that presents itself in person. Uh, but please uh, feel free to reach out to me directly uh, via email or come visit me. I'm on the third floor of DBH. Um, and, and let us know what we can do in computer science uh, in collaboration with you and your company. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Melissa and I'm the Chair of the Department of Informatics and I'm so happy to be with you here today at the ICS Industry Showcase. A little bit about myself, although I'm new in the role of Chair, I've actually been with this department since 2009. I absolutely love it here. <laughs> um, my background is in management and organizational studies. And throughout my career, I've looked at the role of emerging information and digital technologies and the effect they have on our um, everyday practices of work and life outside of work. And in that spirit, I have a book that came out last year called Dreams of the Overworked, Living, Working, and Parenting in the Digital Age. And if that resonates with any of you out there, I highly encourage you to take a look. Now, what is the Department of Informatics? I urge you to think about what are the most kind of pressing headlines you're seeing in the news today. If we think about social media platforms, online games, learning, and the effect of all of these areas and spaces on our youth, misinformation online and the effect that has on the way that the kind of society runs, patterns of bias and artificial intelligence, how we might be systematically like trying to understand our world, but in ways that, that give us false information about how things are actually happening. 
online harassment, healthcare delivery and data privacy, and how do we um, you know, effectively provide one of the most critical services that we do, extremism and online spaces, software bugs and breakdown and stability of these systems that we rely on so completely. I think that it's undeniable that these are some of the biggest problems that are facing us both today and in the future. And informatics, this department, my colleagues, my, the very exciting research that's going on here at ICS is where these issues are being studied, they're taken very seriously, and we're making great strides towards solving them. All with the overarching question motivates everybody in the informatics department, which is how can we do better? How can we create online spaces and everyday interactions in which we are safe, secure, effective, and innovative, and really able to kind of take the potential that is digital technology and use it in society in a way that benefits humanity. We also have a brand new program in games um, design and interactive media. And in this program, we're gonna be preparing students to be the next generation of designers and developers. We're very excited about all that this program has to offer for the, for the department and the school. A few quick pieces of news. One of our junior professors, Stacey Branham, was just named one of the top 10 brilliant minds from popular science for her work on accessibility and adapting commonly used technologies for people with disabilities. One of our senior faculty, Paul Dorish, who just became the Steckler Endowed Chair and the Director of the Steckler Center for Responsible, Ethical, and Accessible Technology. This is really some of the place we're going to be addressing some of these pressing questions. And Constance Steinkuhler, who is just named the Belfer Fellow by the Anti-Defamation League for her current and ongoing work on extremism in online spaces. We're so proud of these faculty and all of the faculty in informatics. It really is an exciting place. It is really part of this exciting school. I'm very proud to speak to you today, and I hope you'll learn more about us. Thank you. So, uh... Next time on our program, the item on, on, on our schedule is uh, a panel uh, with uh, four of our faculty in ICS. Professor Michael Carey will be moderating the panel. Uh, I don't think Mike needs an introduction, but I will still use, uh, I will still introduce him uh, via three sentences. Uh, uh, Mike is uh, one of our uh, Donald Brand professors in information and computer science. Uh, his research area is database systems. Um, he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, but I would say above all, what I think is most impressive is Mike's dedication to teaching our students, uh, both graduate and undergraduate. Uh, I continuously run into students who tell me, I cannot get a degree of this place if I haven't taken Mike's database course. This is most of the computer science students, but I, I think it gives you a sense of uh, Mike's uh, accomplishments and Mike's dedication. To our mission. So, Mike, thank you for running this panel, and I will just, uh, you know, let you run with it. All right. <clears throat> so, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for having me step in to do this. Um, by trade, uh, I think, as Marios indicated, I'm a plumber. I'm the data storage guy, right? So, we I manage data. Um, I have no idea what to do with it. That's somebody else's business. Uh, you know, there's this whole data science pipeline, and there's characteristics in data science of, you know, like what are the jobs. I'm a data engineer not a data scientist. So analyzing data is above my pay grade. Uh, but fortunately, uh, we have four uh, distinguished people here today who are going to be talking to us about the, you can go to the next slide if you would, uh, talking to us about what they're doing for data analytics. So sort of after the data has been stored and handed back, um, we're going to hear about uh, what Stefan Mont is doing with respect to probabilistic deep learning over data, what uh, Jing Zhang is doing in terms of bioinformatics and applications uh, to medicine. 
uh, of data analytics, uh, Vladimir, uh, about uh, what he does with, uh, I think, beyond just stochastic models in biology, which we'll talk about. He's also been in the news a lot in the last year or so. Uh, and maybe he'll tell us a little bit about that. And then Roderick Crooks, uh, who's going to talk to us about data activism. Uh, so without further ado, let's uh, hear each of their presentations. And then um, when they're done, like be taking notes uh, about, you know, really hard questions you can ask them. Uh, and you can put those in the Q&A afterwards and we can have fun. Hello, everyone. My name is Stefan Mund. I'm an assistant professor of computer science at UC Irvine. And the title of my talk is Probabilistic Deep Learning. So most of deep learning is actually non-probabilistic. So for example, take the example of image classification shown here. We take a high dimensional image as an input into a neural network, which is in turn a set of computational units that are uh, connected by so-called weights. And this network then processes the input layer by layer and ultimately predicts a label, typically among a fixed set of candidates. In this example, the word false. So here in this talk, I want to address the following questions. When do probabilist probabilities matter in deep learning? How is probabilistic learning different from regular deep learning? And what are some promising applications and technologies? Now, the first scenario that I would like to discuss is that we still want to do supervised learning, but we want to improve our predictions. For example, a common problem is that the predictions of a deep neural network are highly unreliable, especially when it comes to assessing their own confidence estimates, or um, in particular, when the data the model is deployed on is systematically different from the data that the model was trained on. A popular solution to this is to build averages of neural networks depicted in this picture shown here, where every member in this ensemble of networks has a slightly different set of parameters. Ideally, we want to average a network over the so-called Bayesian posterior distribution over all possible parameters that are consistent with observations, but this is typically very expensive to compute. My work on um, stochastic gradient descent as approximate Bayesian inference shows ways of computing this expensive posterior distribution in a much cheaper way, only doing stochastic gradient descent, and um, therefore allowed training such models in a much, in a much faster fashion. We also revealed limits of the conventional Bayesian approach in other papers. The second scenario that I would like to address is that we actually don't care too much about improving predictions, but we are actually interested in the model itself. For example, for automatically finding interesting patterns in the data. Now, it turns out that there was a previous generation of machine learning approaches called probabilistic models or Bayesian networks that were very successful at this time, but deep, net deep networks are actually by default uninterpretable and not very well suited. My work hybridizes both approaches and allows me to find hidden structure in large data sets. For example, the video here shows the result of fitting a so-called dynamic word embedding model to large collections of historical texts taken from uh, Google Books over many decades. So this model automatically understands that words change their meanings over time and, visualize, and visually depicts this in a so-called latent space where nearby words have similar semantic meaning. And then we see that over time, words like broadcast change their association with other words, here moving from an agricultural meaning towards the modern meaning associated with media and press. And finally, in the last scenario, we frequently are interested in learning the data distribution itself. This is particularly interesting for data compression, where we want to replace commonly occurring data points with short bit strings and rare data points with longer bit strings. My group significantly contributed to this emerging field of neural data compression, which oftentimes relies on a particular architecture called the variational autoencoder, but using highly specialized network architectures and priors and also different algorithms for encoding and decoding. With these tricks and models, not only did we um, achieve the best performing model for compressing images, but more recently also for video. We also work on more theoretical problems related to compression, as well as very applied problems related to, for example, distributed computing. This brings me to the conclusions. 
While deterministic learning works in many cases, other applications require probabilistic extensions. We talked about uh, neural um, ensemble averages, in particular Bayesian deep learning. We talked about structure discovery. And we also talked about modeling the data distribution for the purpose of anomaly detection. Now, many topics that we work on were not covered. Um, in particular, I also work on deep anomaly detection and applications in climate science, in particular also with an undergraduate student, as well as applications in physics and chemistry more broadly. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm going to introduce our research in bioinformatics in our department as a big data science for biology and medicine. Bioinformatics is a subdiscipline of biology and computer science concerned with acquisition, storage, analysis, and dissemination of biological data. Computer science has been and is now playing essential roles in bioinformatics. It is actually one of the four cornerstones in bioinformatics research. We all know the famous Moore's law during the IT revolution, which refers to Gordon Moore's perception that the number of transistors on a microchip doubles every two years, though the cost of the computer is halved. Moore's law states that we can expect the speed and the capability of our computers to increase every couple of years. Although Moore's law mainly applies to computing hardware, DNA sequencing cost has followed a similar pattern for many years, approximately halving each two years. However, ever since January 2008, there has been a break in that trend with sequencing cost rapidly declining after that date. For instance, it took scientists $100 million to sequence the first human genome in 2000. But now the cost of sequencing on one human genome has dropped below 1,000, which means we have entered the era of predictive and personalized medicine. Now the bottleneck of this has shifted from actual sequencing to data analysis, where data science is playing more important roles. With the explosion of available whole genome sequencing data, we are now able to design advanced machine learning algorithms for personalized medicine. In other words, we can use the individual's genetic profile to guide decisions made in regarding to the prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment of disease. Specifically, with the population scale sequencing data, we can now explore the dark genome in detail, which was considered to be the major obstacle for the interpretation of the function of genetic variation and its impact in disease. To prepare our students' skills specific in this area, we developed specialized AI and machine learning courses in bioinformatics track. We have also designed for first hands-on research projects and provided various research opportunities for both undergraduate and graduate students to analyze genomic sequencing data and perform disease genome mining. Many of these projects have turned out to be popular open source software for the scientific community. Hello, my name is Vladimir Minin. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Statistics uh, in ICS, UC Irvine. I'm here to tell you a little bit about my research and how I engage students in this research. My uh, overall interest is in uh, dynamical systems in biological sciences. Here on the first slide, I'm showing you uh, an example of such a biological system. This is a uh, process of stem cells producing uh, mature blood uh, cells. So hematopoietic stem cells, they live in our body, and every day they produce uh, T cells and B cells and other types of cells that we need uh, uh, in order to operate. Now, uh, what's interesting is that we still don't know the details about this process, uh, and we use this amazing technology called barcoding, which allows to us to barcode individual cells, stem cells, with uh, 
artificial pieces of DNA that you can then read off later as a, exactly as a barcode uh, when we sample cells from, from the bloodstream. And so this figure showing that this, we can do this at different time points and see the offspring of a particular stem cell and how it appears later, how these offspring appear later uh, in the data. So we collect millions and millions of data points like this and we uh, feed them into the uh, statistical algorithm that we developed to learn about the rates of differentiation and other details of this model of hematopoiesis, the process of, of blood cell formation. Um, the next example is really my most active area of research right now, it's infectious disease analytics, which is related mathematically, but not necessarily biologically to the previous application. So it turns out mathematical machinery is very similar and statistical machinery as well. So here we're interested in using surveillance data of a particular infectious disease, uh, Ebola in West Africa in this example, um, to learn about the dynamics of the disease spread. So we're interested in how the disease spreads within each country, for example, uh, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone, um, using these classical SEIR models. But also we're interested in, in these exportation importation events, how much the disease, so to speak, traveled between the countries and how much that drove the dynamics of the disease. Um, so viruses, uh, of course, always uh, interact with our immune system because our immune, immune system recognizes pathogens and reacts to them. And so this is sort of the uh, two enemies uh, across the, uh, this uh, war line. And so the, and these enemies are constantly in a state of war in our immune system and pathogens. So I'm also interested in immunology, how our immune system is able to respond to pathogens. And one of these processes is an amazing process it's called DDJ recombination. It's a process that allows us to produce antibodies to new pathogens that we haven't seen before. The way we're doing it right now with the help of the vaccine, but also uh, in, in response to the infection with the novel coronavirus. So using sequence data, we can sequence these antibodies and uh, determine the composition of these antibodies. And, understand, and we're trying to understand what sequence of events, mutations in this case, have to happen in order to produce the antibodies that work. Because it turns out we produce a lot of antibodies that don't work, we just discard them. And only the ones that work through a process of natural selection stay in our bodies and help us fight pathogens in the future. So that's another aspect. Uh, lastly, I would like to mention the um, applications that of the uh, of this uh, surveillance and uh, infectious analytics that we have uh, been follow, uh, doing with uh, in collaboration with local healthcare agency, Orange County Healthcare Agency, but also with, in collaboration with California Department of Public Health. We have been involved in the pandemic response since March 2020. I'm highlighting one of the uh, resources we created. It's a website that we created together with uh, the group of uh, Forex Smith. Uh, professor of computer science here in ICS, and lots of amazing students, uh, uh, undergraduate students in data science, master's students in statistics and computer science, and PhD students in statistics and computer science uh, contributed to this project. So it's our outreach project, if you will, where we, uh, every, every day and every week, we update these websites with new data streams and uh, helping the public and public servants to understand the course of the pandemic. Um, I'm also teaching a, a related course this uh, fall uh, called Statistical Methods of Infectious Diseases, where I'm involving masters and PhD level students from depart various departments at ICS in, in trying to teach them how to analyze infectious disease data. With that, I will stop and thank you for your attention. Uh, hi, everyone. I guess it's my turn to go. Is that right? Okay. I'm just going to start uh, speaking into the void. Okay. Uh, I'm Roderick Crooks. I'm an assistant professor of informatics. Uh, I am especially interested in the study of data intensive computational systems and data analytics. So in that I include aggregation, analysis, and visualization. As these technologies are increasingly incorporated into the infrastructures of public life. So my research centers the experience of racialized and minoritized communities with respect to data intensive computation. Uh, and especially interested in uh, how these kinds of technologies are integrated with forms of public service. 
So you could consider that uh, public education, criminal justice, law enforcement, uh, financial services and provision of credit. Uh, so I use theories of datafication and data justice to do a lot of my work. I've co-designed an undergraduate course in data analytics for use in schools that serve uh, mostly working class communities of color. We call this a culturally informed curriculum. And I did this project along with uh, Dr. Sharnia Artis and Professor Samir Singh. But today I'm gonna to focus on three activities that touch graduate and undergraduate teaching. Okay, so one of my activities in this area has been a series of workshops called Datafication and Community Activism. So here I'm using the sociological theory of datafication and this theory names two related things. So one, it's a kind of proliferation of data intensive computation uh, in many sites of daily life, work and play. So you could think of this as where uh, some of these uh, very sophisticated technologies that the previous speakers described go out into the world and are incorporated into what we commonly call different kinds of domains. We are also talking at the same time about a set of cultural expectations about data and what data can do. And this provides the impetus for these technologies to be uh, incorporated in sites very distant from where they are created, very distant from the uses for which they are created. One site I study quite frequently is public education. So there I'm looking at all kinds of analytic technologies incorporated into the administration of public schools. Here in this workshop, I'm looking at a related, we could think I'm looking at it on the other side. I'm looking at it from the perspective of communities where these services are rolled out. So this annual event draws together uh, different kinds of stakeholders to map out new research agendas that draw on support and advance activist responses to datafication in minoritized communities. So I'm talking about scholars, journalists, undergraduate students, graduate students, community activists, uh, data and information professionals. We all come together uh, and try to think through the relationship between activism and research. You can see on the picture that's in the center of the screen, uh, some of the group that we brought together for a two-day workshop. Uh, we've done this three times, uh, once with the support of uh, ICS and ICS Inspiration Award. So thank you for that, Dean Marios. Okay, another activity um, that I was glad to participate in was an undergraduate REU. That's a research experience for undergraduates. And this is one that I ran jointly with colleagues in the social sciences. So our goal was to get ICS students, mostly in computer science, to understand how data analysis, aggregation, and visualization has been used to pursue social justice projects, mostly in Southern California. This is an example of data justice, what we are calling a data justice, an attempt to mobilize data for community defined goals. So our RU students assembled a database of community based organizations and community organizers that were working in this space. We found quite a bit of variety in the technical capacities of these organizations, ranging from very sophisticated shops that crunch large data sets for legal and governmental purposes to uh, grassroots approaches, very bespoke kind of small data approaches. Uh, as an example of the latter, the kind of grassroots approach, we talked to community organizers in South Los Angeles who had assembled a database that collected information about community members killed by police. So from these very different groups, we learned that the promise of data analysis as a means of pursuing activism. Uh, we learned about the promise of data analysis as a means of pursuing activism, but also the risks and burdens of this approach. And on the left, I've included a picture of some of our uh, undergraduate and graduate students. You can see them sort of mapping out with post-its these different approaches to data and data justice. And then we assembled a kind of set of case studies that gave them a chance to do a little bit of qualitative research as well. I should add that all of these students are very sophisticated uh, computer science students with great technical capacities. So it was a kind of stretch for them to try to incorporate qualitative approaches to these things. Okay, uh, and then finally, this uh, last thing I wanna to point to is an NSF project I call Community Organizing for Datafied Worlds. And in this project, my students in the Evoke Lab are helping me interview 100 community organizers based in working class communities of color. Uh, we're using a working theory of what community organizers in this space are doing that we are calling agonistic data practices. And by this mean, we wanna look at how community organizers are using the affective and narrative potentials of data to build grassroots power and also to try to influence policies of the state. We're especially interested in uh, levels of governance other than the national. So we're thinking about city, state, and county governments. 
This project has already turned up a number of documents produced by communities themselves that help us understand how naive or cynical deployments of technology by academia and industry can harm racialized and minoritized communities, material that I've incorporated in my graduate and undergraduate teaching. So these are just a few things that I've worked on thinking about the consequences of data analytics data more broadly. Uh, so that's it. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so I'd like to thank all of our speakers for uh, sort of giving us an overview of what they're doing. Um, hopefully all of you have been doing what I've been doing, which is taking notes and asking questions. And uh, for at least one of the speakers, I'm going to need about a three hour meeting to <laughs> like super curious about uh, some of what I heard. Um, but so I'm, what I'm looking at right now is the Q&A panel. And so everyone who's here should uh, pop up the Q&A panel. If you go down to the bottom, uh, at least on my machine, uh, of your Zoom window, you'll see Q&A and you should open that up. Uh, and what I see is, is a list of open questions. Uh, and we just answered all of them so far uh, because there are no open questions yet. So you should go ahead and toss your questions there. Uh, use the Q&A function, and then Emily and I will monitor that uh, and use that to ask questions. Uh, meanwhile, I can seed this with a couple of the questions. Maybe I'll do a round of you know, something uh, for each of the panelists. Uh, I'll go in the order that they, that they spoke in, um, and then hopefully by that time, you'll have questions if you want. Uh, so please you know, feel free to, to chime in, uh, and we'll give everybody an opportunity to ask. Also, for the panelists, um, you know, I, I'm going to ask one of you a question, but if, if you have you know, sort of opinions about something or would like to add something, uh, please feel free to kind of to make this a panel, uh, not for just to be a Q&A, but rather to, you know, sort of chime in and contribute. Um, so let me start with Stefan. Um, and so you sort of showed your uh, various things that you're working on. Your example was a horse. And I was thinking, you know, sort of uh, that's a horse of a different color, you know, sort of being a quote from uh, from the Wizard of Oz and wondering, you know, that would be an anomaly if it was a purple horse, for example. Uh, if you want to talk a little bit about uh, the anomaly detection and like what it means to be an anomaly and, you know, are anomalies moving targets? Yeah, great questions. So thanks a lot. Yeah, so one of the, the, the directions of my research that I didn't really get to cover a lot is this uh, field of anomaly detection. And the idea there is essentially to teach machines to identify data points that are systematically different from all the data that um, a human or an algorithm has ever encountered before, right? And, um, and the problem with anomaly detection is actually that you cannot simply use, you know, what we currently, you know, normally do, namely supervised learning. In other, in other words, training an algorithm explicitly uh, on, on what an anomaly looks like, because, you know, by the de definition, an anomaly is everything else, right? Everything else that you've never seen before. Uh, so it's like involving totally different training paradigms. And um, there have been many proposals to do that. Um, you know, some are uh, still supervised, some are unsupervised, and some are self-supervised uh, learning based. And um, of course, applications are, are kind of pretty important. You want to be able to find fraudulent activity uh, in, in financial records. You might want to see a cancer cell in, in tissue and things like that. Um, and so what we do specifically is kind of to try to uh, use these unsupervised methods that I showed that essentially assign probabilities to, to data points and then let the lowest scoring probabilities identify the anomalies. So that's that's roughly the uh, the picture. And um, to, to some degree, it's very successful, but there are many anomalies that are way too complicated for us to detect them. For example, if, uh, if an anomaly is relational in an image, for example, you see a man riding an ostrich, but not a horse, right? So that would be like a relationship between the man and the ostrich. You know, for that, like our current algorithms are far too stupid, so they, they you know, you need like a really complicated model that that understands these relational issues, and and that's what you know the current state of the art has not met met yet at this point. Right, interesting, cool. All right, thanks. I'm going to do one round, and then we're starting to get some questions, so that's uh, that's great. Um, Zheng, I wanted to sort of turn to you next and just sort of find out what your thoughts are. You talked about kind of the uh, architectural trends, right, and sort of how Moore's law and how you know people in architectures and, and computing have talked about you know so this is stopped, right? So we're we're kind of in computational trouble. We need to scale our systems out rather than up. And I was curious, um, you know, what your view is of like how AI can impact future medicine, and also just as a plumber, like what are sort of the requirements, like computationally, in terms of, uh, you know, what kind of uh, machines are you going to need to, to, you know, make AI do what it can do for us in the future? 
uh, in medicine. Yes. <clears throat> so uh, I want to share some of my thinking on this because we have been working on precision medicine like uh, for a long, long time. I think AI has been already been like a uh, playing and will continue like a uh, play important roles in medical practices such as uh, diagnose process, treatment protocol development, uh, drug development, uh, personalized medicine and uh, patient monitoring and, uh, and the care services. And we think AI can make sense of massive data, including clinical data, genomic data, imaging data, and uh, some like health record data to help the physicians to really make more efficient, accurate, and personalized the diagnose, the diagnosis and the treatments. And uh, I think right now, both in institutions like um, the Mayo Clinic, Memorial Sloan, Kettering, like Kettering like Cancer Center, including our UCI House, they all have AI initiatives to integrate this large unstructured data to like help with personal medicine. And, uh, and even in like industry right now, for instance, uh, in Google, in Amazon, they all have like AI algorithms for healthcare, for instance, they try to develop different uh, like language processing APIs to extract unstructured data from medical like a house record. And uh, for ourselves, we mainly work on like genomics. We feel that's uh, like a great area to work on. But currently, like one of the difficulties is the amount of data that that the scientist, either like the physician, like uh, the physicians or some like uh, biologists that they generated is way beyond what we can handle, what the current algorithms that can handle. And I think it's important to develop like uh, scalable algorithms. For instance, we need to develop algorithms that can be e like uh, extendable to like billions of cells to be analyzed together. And we need to develop online learning algorithms that we do not train from scratch when new data come in and we can just incorporate them with the, the existing system. And also we need to have efficient data storage for those data. So currently that's way beyond what we can, we can, we can handle at the moment. And it's being accumulated like a faster than we, we, we expect previously. So I think they are all like uh, important questions that need to be handled in this area. And, uh, but uh, there's like uh, no doubt that AI is gonna play important roles in the future for diagnose, disease prevention and uh, drug development. Cool, thanks. Yeah, it seems like NSF definitely agrees, right? Because they've announced some recent major, major initiatives of uh, sort of yes. national yes. AI initiatives, especially with healthcare being one of the focuses. Yes, yes. Cool. All right, let me turn to Vladimir. So, uh, you know, sort of a couple of years ago, we twice in a, two years in a row, we sort of co-taught the introductory data science classes, right? And so we did that together. Um, and then, you know, you've, you're doing your rocket science, but sort of during COVID, I've been reading about you in the news, right? So it's like, yeah, that's the guy I co-taught with, right? I know him, right? So I would actually like to kind of uh, bring you back to your last slide and have you talk a little bit more about your experience with uh, data analytics and like interacting, you know, sort of with the public. You've been one of the, you know, Andrew Neumuer has been one of the key spokespersons for public health, but I've seen you cited quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, sort of data, especially earlier in the pandemic. You talk a little bit about data analytics and, uh, you know, sort of public good. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Uh, uh, so yeah, it was an interesting year for statisticians, especially for those of us working in infectious diseases. And uh, we have learned quite a bit. We have learned that we need to invest in public uh, health, uh, for sure, because the data that uh, uh, is available to all, uh, not only publicly available data, even privately available data is not in a good shape. So definitely public uh, healthcare agencies uh, do need a lot of help from everyone, um, especially from funding from the government. And yeah, communicating uh, uh, is, is interesting. We have been involved in lots of uh, communication with the uh, 
local uh not only public health departments but also just you know we went with some my public health colleagues and gave talks to school districts where they were trying to understand how safe it is to reopen and what they should do and so assessing risk is an interesting uh and explaining risks uh individual risks and population risks that was a challenging task and to be honest i was a little uh, reluctant to, to jump into this in initially uh, when we started uh, kind of going public with this. Uh, and I was hoping that Andrew, for example, would take over for me. But then I realized that a lot of technical questions cannot really be outsourced. And I, someone uh, close to the data needs to explain, explain these concepts. And uh, so I changed my mind, to be honest, during the pandemic about this and became a little more vocal about, about uh, the sort of data aspects of the pandemic response. Cool, thanks. Um, so, Roderick, I guess let's sort of turn to you and ask, ask you something. So, um, we have a lot of sort of data science and, and sort of rocket science going on, and you're basically looking at something quite different, which is more the social, uh, you know, the role that, that data can play in society and the way it can bias things and so on. And one thing I'm curious about, and feel free to change the subject if it gets, you know, sort of uncomfortable, but um, it feels like over the last few years, uh, you know, sort of as a society, we sort of lost grounding in some ways, right? That like, you know, what is, you know, what's real, what's not, do I believe data? How do I, you know, where do I find my data? What, whose data do I believe? And I'm curious if, you know, sort of what, you know, from an informatics perspective and a society perspective, what your thoughts are um, on, you know, sort of how data analytics can kind of help perhaps uh, reground us and get us back to a place where, you know, there are things like, you know, sort of facts and truths and things that are, are you know, real. I just, to me, this is a big challenge. I feel like, you know, sort of with social media, as computer scientists, we should feel a little bit like the physicists felt, like after the atomic bomb, right? This, this huge, uh, you know, sort of huge impact on, on society has come from our technology unintendedly. Uh, and it seems like data analytics can maybe help with that. And so, you know, there's sort of an open-ended question, but I think you get where I'm coming from, hopefully. Sure, thanks for the question. Um, in my undergraduate class, we actually begin kind of the history of computing at the moment of the invention of the nuclear bomb. And then we look at the kind of connections between uh, US militarism and also the kind of creation of computing and kind of the figures that are involved, the creation of the National Science Foundation. So I think it's, uh, it's not a coincidence that you would mention those things together. So I, I think there's always been a kind of Frankenstein story in yes. computing. Um, and also ideas in that story that predate the uh, creation of computing, which is a way to say I'm kind of interested in these like cultural aspects and cultural dynamics of computing and computing systems. So when I study datafication, I'm very interested in the tools, the platforms, the data itself that were that are at issue. But I'm also interested in these cultural expectations about data and what data can do. And I think your question points that they are these expectations are unsettled. And so on one hand, we want to take these uh, new ways of knowing and new capacities for seeing things that we are using in the study of disease or that we are using in the study of genomics. We want to use those techniques to know other things that we want to know. So uh, think we want to know what's the best way to organize the school system. We want to know what's the uh, you know, most efficient way to design a transit system. Uh, we want to know public things. Uh, we want to know essentially how to organize the public. So the catch there is that the, the public has always been organized in a way that is unequal. So the public sphere itself is constituted by a series of kind of gendered and raced and classed expectations. So when you add to that, this kind of layer of uh, sort of computational complexity, you wind up with some very unusual results. So it's my hope that we could identify uh, kinds of practices and kinds of projects that are emancipatory that helped us build the kind of public that we want to build, and we could identify those that are harmful. But the, the kind of core, I guess, tenet of informatics research, going back even to like the 1980s, has been that technology is not uh, good or evil, but is also not innocent. And so we have to work through those kind of non-innocent relations in terms of technical capacities and material basis of computing, but also in terms of our cultural expectations and our kind of public structures. But yeah, it's a, it's a complete mess. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. All right, let's see. So um, let's just see what the what we're getting on the open questions. Um, so let's just uh, direct the first one kind of at the panel in general. So it's, it's uh, please share any UCI ISC current 
longevity or health span data projects. Oops, and that discussion, that question just disappeared. That was answered, I guess, Emily? I was looking so, at the sorry, the rest. So the rest of the question is um, the age at which first debilitating disease appears, followed by multiple linked morbidities, frailty, and eventually death. Thanks. So I think the question is really just, is there any current longevity or health span data projects um, surrounding sort of uh, disease and sort of the things that go with that? Yeah. So maybe we'll ask Shannon, I'm aware of one, so I know the answer is yes, <laughs> but I'm sure there are many on campus. So yes, I, I can share some of my experience, including some of the, of the projects under ICS. So we, we do work on various types of disease and uh, uh, related with uh, longevity, for instance, like a cancer and uh, some neurodegenerative disease like uh, Hammer's disease, Parkinson's disease. And we also have done some research about uh, like uh, basic science, like epigenetic changes, like in the aging process, I think that that are all related. So I can give one example of what we have been, we have been doing, like uh, it's somewhat related. We are extending this to other types of disease, for instance, uh, Hammer's disease. That was originally designed for some psychiatric disorders in the brain, because we would like to predict like the risk of a, like a, a person, how, how likely this person can have like a psychiatric disorders, for instance, schizophrenia, bipolar, although we are extending it to like aging related, uh, like neurodegenerative diseases. But the thing is previously, like uh, some intermediate level expression data, for example, how the genes are expre expressed in the cell are used are the best predictors. But unfortunately for this brain related disease, it's very difficult, it's almost unacceptable to cut an individual's brain, get a little bit of tissue and check the gene expression. So we build some pre-structured deep neural networks to directly predict from one person's genotype how likely this person may have carried some type of disease. But the genotype data is very easy to get. You just need a tube of blood. So there's some cool work there. And currently we are using single cell data to, to see exactly which type of the cell type is responsible for these neurodegenerative diseases. And uh, yeah, a lot of cool stuff going there. I can like follow up with more details. If you are interested in this area, feel free to email me. I, I can either introduce my research or some of my colleagues research to you. Thank you. So the next question uh, on the hotline uh, is directed to Roderick. And the question is, where do you go to collect your data? And do you have a goal for this research? Or are you really asking open questions that'll let the data lead you to answers? Uh, sure, thanks for the question. So um, my approach to research is informed actually by uh, what in social informatics they call the Irvine School. But this is uh, a kind of way of doing research uh, that originated here at UC Irvine. Uh, starting with the work of Rob Kling in the 1990s and continuing on through the work of people like Professor Durish and Professor Bowker here. So that basically holds that you are interested in technical things and you, by being interested in technical things, you are also interested in social things. So I'm always interested in whatever kind of material basis we can get. So documents, data sets, computer programs, lines of code, but then we're also interested in people and we're interested in what people do with those things. So uh, where I go to get data, frequently I go to organizations that are incorporating some kind of new computational capacity in their work. So that would be things like charter management organizations, school districts, universities. And so there I wanna find out kind of what data professionals, what tools data professionals are using, kind of what processes they're involved in and what the kind of important inputs and outputs of that work are. Then we wanna examine that work as much as possible. And then we also use qualitative ethnographic methods to interview people who are working. And ideally, if you can, you actually wanna watch people work and sort of see what they do. Cause there's always a difference between how people describe their work and then what they actually do. And then uh, the other place that I'm interested in working is I work a lot with community-based organizations and community organizers. These tend to be sort of scrappier, less resourced organizations whose technical capacities uh, 
generally are kind of lower than you would get at a large, more sophisticated organization. Not always, but uh, generally. And so there I'm interested in the same things. I ask, uh, I attend to kind of how people do their work, what tools they need, how they use these tools and what the important inputs and outputs of that work are. So always looking at people and the tools that they use together. Uh, I hope that answers your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, and then our next caller uh, has a question about uh, sort of the role of data science. So the question is, uh, currently largely most of the data science roles are aimed at uh, either making you know, business gains or advances in medicine. Uh, like what else can we do? Uh, with our data. So, you know, what other fields will, will we see data science playing a role uh, sort of in, in the commercial world that maybe not just for, you know, sort of the business piece of the commercial world? I don't know. And I'll sort of open that up to anybody who, who's on the panel. I guess I can, I can answer that. Um, sure. I mean, probably others can too. Yeah. But I guess sometimes commercial applications take sort of surprising turns, right? So, uh, I mean, for example, if you think about the climate, right, and global warming, at first, you might think that this is something that is clearly societally irrelevant, but I mean, um, you know, could it ever be commercially relevant? But it, it actually turns out that a lot of insurance companies care very much about global warming, right? And mm -hmm. they, like reinsurance companies, want to know sort of about their risks, about like hurricanes and uh, things like that. So I, th I think this would be kind of a good good application. Another application is quantum computing, right? Where which started as blue sky research and then suddenly you know, evolved into something where, where a lot of uh, companies invest into nowadays. Right? So it's, it's not always completely predictable. Cool. All right. Thank you. Any other panelists want to chime in with thoughts about uh, where I, data I, can help? Yeah. Vladimir? I, I would just say that, you know, what, what we say when we teach this course, what we, for undergraduate student, students in data science, Capstone, that we, that Mike mentioned, we caught out together with him and then I, I, I caught out with Chen Li another computer science faculty member is that it's actually hard to find uh, now, I think, uh, industries and companies that do not want to use or, uh, data science. It's much harder because we, we collect data, the sensors are available, uh, all sorts of sensors and uh, other, you know, social media and so on. And so uh, it, it's, it's definitely um, where I think we are at the point where definitely there are more questions, data science questions than people who are able to answer them. And this will probably continue for some number of years, uh, who knows how long before we exhaust this. But right now it's actually hard to even enumerate all, all the possibilities, to be honest. Any other panelists? So I guess one thing I would add just kind of an anecdotally is, um, you know, I have my day job at UCI and I have a, a, a non-day job uh, where I consult for a company that uh, manages data and talks to people who use data. Uh, and about two years ago, I found myself in Ann Arbor, Michigan at Domino's Pizza headquarters. And they're using data science, right, to figure out all kinds of things. And the woman who was in charge of their data science group was frighteningly good, right? So I was sort of kidding one of my graduate students going, you know, well, when you finish, you can, you know, when, once you get your PhD, you can go get a job at Domino's, right? But it's like everybody, you know, including, you know, sort of companies you would never think about. Uh, are making use of data and data science. So I think the, you know, my personal opinion is the field is like really bright. I think I agree with Vladimir. It's like, show me somebody who doesn't need this right at this point. All right, next question um, uh, from an anonymous attendee is, is uh, and could be for anyone, but maybe, uh, well, yeah, it could be actually for anybody. So, so does UCI have a toolkit or data collection tools uh, for the community for like patient collected data? And maybe I just sort of augment that and say, you know, sort of, are there also issues like how do we, you know, from a medical standpoint, there's HIPAA and there's privacy and kind of how does that play into some of the things one might like to do uh, with respect to patient data and healthcare and so on. So I could just briefly mention that uh, it's too bad that we don't have Kai, Kai Zhang from informatics on the call because he is our kind of main uh, go-to guy for electronic health care records and he works a lot with School of Medicine. Uh, of course, we do have access UCI researchers uh, uh, like Kai, but also all of us on the panel, for example, can ask Kai for, uh, to, to participate in that research as well. We have access to electronic health care records, not only from UCI hospital, but also from a large network of hospitals. And we can tap definitely into the whole UC health easily, but even larger than that. So definitely this is happening and lots of exciting activities are happening. Moreover, Kai actually hired last year, 
10 of our, if not more, of our undergraduate data science students to do uh, research uh, projects with uh, him because they need so many data scientists and they, they finally discovered our data science program too in the School of Medicine. So now they are uh, coming every month and nice. asking like, do you have more data science students to help us with all these data analysis that we need to do? So right. our students are very engaged, started, starting from last year, became very engaged in the analyzing electronic healthcare uh, uh, records because they, again, the number of questions about sort of safety of drugs and uh, other things is, is enormous. And you, they don't have uh, basically enough people to, uh, to run these analyses. Interesting. Any other thoughts on tools and things from the other panelists? Actually, Michael, I just wanted to go back to this question about um, where else we might want data scientists working or other kind of domains that want to get in on it. Yeah. And um, I agree with Professor Menon, it's probably all of them. And I think one, one space of um, conflict is definitely public facing or public service facing organizations who are essentially, uh, they have difficulty attracting people who have the capacities that they need. So in many cases, these organizations are expected to be able to do things with data and they can't because they don't have enough people to work for them. So one example would be in public education. So many kinds of tools and platforms are generating data about what students do in school, but there aren't enough people who can, there's a, there's a, a gap, I guess, in the capacities of these organizations to get people who can do that kind of work. So one thing I, I think the school can do is to produce public-minded data scientists who are interested in doing that kind of work. Um, again, not just in education, but in other kinds of domains where people are doing kind of public community facing work. And there's definitely a real need for that. So to, just to follow up on that, I'm curious because my wife's a teacher and so she's a consumer of, uh, you know, such education data. How would you see that working in terms of like, where would individuals who wanted to get involved in that, where would they, for whom would they work? Because I think of school districts and I sort of look at the, you know, the paychecks of computer scientists and the paychecks of teachers, you know, with 20 years and a master's going, okay, you know, so how do you, how do you get people with those skills into the positions at organizations that can fund that kind of? Well, some things I've seen, um, I've studied, for example, charter management organizations. And so these are kind of smaller entities that run networks of schools, frequently in racialized and minoritized communities. They'll have a network of say like 30 schools. I studied one kind of network of schools in South and East LA. Um, and so their approach was to kind of train up their own workforce. And so they took people who were interested in education and passionate about it, but did not have a kind of data science background and sort of train them up themselves. But I guess one problem with this approach, as you point out, is that uh, once that person becomes trained, there's a strong incentive for them to find work that pays more. Right. I don't have a great answer for this, um, but I do think that uh, uh, people who have that sort of orientation towards public service right. and have quantitative skills are in high demand. So right. um, perhaps there is some uh, way we could inculcate such an orientation, but yeah, there's definitely a mismatch between um, pay and skills. Right. Cool. All right, let's see. Um, one question I wanted to like cover before we uh, sort of have to give up is we have a bunch of students uh, who are pursuing degrees in ICS, you know, data science, computer science, informatics, um, you know, some many at the bachelor's level, some at the master's level, and maybe for, for everyone, like if, if students were interested uh, in doing the kinds of work you're doing, um, what would they need like kind of as, as sort of the price of entry prerequisites in order to be useful to you and someone you would want to engage with. Uh, and then also, uh, what will they learn? And then, you know, for our industrial sponsors who are here, uh, what can they look forward to in the, in the output from ICS? So maybe start with the input requirements, uh, you know, for each of you, maybe how does, a, how does a student get involved in what you're doing if they're interested, both for bachelor's and master's type students? Uh, so maybe start with Stefan. Yeah, uh, good question. So, um, so I guess from my field, I, I want to emphasize uh, that machine learning is actually not only computer science. Machine learning is actually really an interdisciplinary field at the boundary or the intersection between statistics, computer science, and I would say applied mathematics. So usually when I look for students who are really, you know, and, and hoping to really improve algorithms in machine learning, they really need to know all three of those skills, right? So I particularly look for, for grades in uh, 
in highly mathematical courses. And I want to really re-emphasize here that, uh, you know, there, there are many voices on the inter internet that say, well, you can forget about maths, you know, data science is all about practical implement implementation skills. I totally disagree. <laughs> so uh, I, I think mathematics is extremely important, but also you have to be able to implement your ideas, right? And in particular, if you kind of are um, skilled at both, if you're strong in mathematics and you can actually pro do good programming, this skill set is in such high demand. I mean, those are the highest paying jobs out there, right? So um, just want to re-emphasize that. So that's what I'm looking for also for my own research. And then of course, what you learn is, um, you know, learning a programming framework such as PyTorch, which are used everywhere in industry, uh, learning to think like a researcher, come up with your own ideas, write papers, and actually, uh, you know, identify little niche topics that you can work on and, and kind of uh, you know, get your, your name out there in terms of maybe a workshop paper, right? That would be a good outcome that you can then use to get a better job or maybe apply for grad school and things like that. Excellent. Uh, Jing? Yeah. So I, I want to like a second part of uh, uh, Stefan's point. Uh, and uh, we welcome students from all backgrounds. If you check my website, you can see people from our plat class, from computer science, from chemistry, and they are all working on data science. But one thing that I would like to emphasize is at least a student should be like uh, comfortable in learning something new. They are comfortable to talk about uh, like uh, modeling aspects. So they are comfortable with Python programming. And all, of course, other programming language are all, all okay. But if you are working deep learning, probably PyTorch is currently the most popular thing you, you would like to work on. And, uh, but uh, we do have projects for both undergraduates, so for master students, and we have separate projects for PhD students. And they are all like listed on my website and feel free to check. And we have, successful stories from those inter students I call like inter students and uh, they have publications in tier one like CS conferences like uh, recently we have ISND like uh, like uh, papers accepted uh, and many of our like some of our like undergraduate like interns contributed to part of it and another example is one of my other math, like uh, like uh, undergraduate he, he, he worked in the lab for years and, uh, and he had many, many papers out. And uh, currently he's like uh, going to the medical school, but uh, he's also getting an MD PhD with a PhD in computer science. So there are all kinds of possibilities and we are here to help. So you can go to check the website. We have different types of projects and we encourage students to have like, like who, who, who have different backgrounds to like go to data science and we are here to help. All right, thank you, uh, Vladimir. Yeah, I would like to comment from sort of my uh, point of view of the, uh, my role that I uh, had as an undergraduate vice chair of uh, statistics where I was overseeing data science major for three years and just going to a little le different level. So I agree with Stefan and Jing about uh, research, but coming back to kind of the maybe the minimal requirements that would get you in the door for data science uh, is it from the undergrad. I would say a C a databases and SQL is probably number one, super important. If you don't have that, it's unlikely uh, to, to get uh, even, even to be noticed or whatever. Um, that's not enough. For you need something else, some, some data analytic skills. So maybe at least a couple of statistics classes for which you do know to know some math as well. So here, you, the math coming back to you. Um, but again, if you entry level, most likely you will be managing data and not really analyzing. It's not that common to, to for the entry data science jobs to start with like, okay, here's the, uh, give me insights uh, for, from this data set. I don't know how to do, to do anything with it. Please give me some insights. That's not gonna happen to anyone. First, you will be asked to manage some database, maybe move some data around, maybe clean some data, wrangle some data. Maybe eventually someone will trust you to uh, do some simple analyses that someone has done already. And for that, you need to know, uh, I would say both R and Python. So th those are both are important. Uh, R, R, R has become a data science uh, lingua franca. So really uh, lots of tools are available and everything you can do in Python, you can, you can do in, in R and vice versa. So, but knowing both is probably gonna be an advantage, but that's kind of the, you know, data, databases, SQL, 
and a little bit of R and Python will uh, will get you uh, uh, foot in the door uh, in, in, in many cases, I would say. Got it. All right. Uh, I think side note, what you said is also the argument for maybe getting a master's degree, right? So, to, get the, to get those more interesting questions asked of you. Uh, that's a separate exactly. That's a topic yeah. for another panel. Um, Roderick. So what does the student need to, to sort of get your attention and be helpful? Sure. So the undergraduate students that I've worked with, either in independent studies or as part of an RU, have generally been um, students who were either in computer science or some other uh, sort of more technical field who were interested in learning more about societal consequences of technology. So I looked for writing ability and some demonstrated commitment to community work. So those were the most important things for me. I'm definitely interested in technical skills because then sometimes you need to be able to understand at a very high level what a particular kind of application does or what it takes as input and what it produces as output. Mm -hmm. But I definitely am looking for reading and writing ability and also some demonstrated interest uh, in particularly in working class communities of color or some other kind of community. A lot of my students work with uh, refugee communities or they work with immigrant communities. And so here they're really interested in thinking about like in this place at this time, what are the consequences of the different technologies that are in use? All right, thank you. So at this point I'd like to do before I ask any more questions of the panelists, do a time check with uh, Marios and Emily and see where we are in terms of where they'd like us to be. Mike, just as a heads up, everything's looking good. So feel free to continue on and then I'll, I'll message you on the side. Okay, all right. Um, so I'll take that, I'll go back to the Q&A list. Um, and so I think I'm gonna rephrase the first question uh, and maybe uh, point it at Stefan. Uh, basically it's, you're not paranoid if they are out to get you, right? So, so there's all of this sort of, you know, sort of adversarial people trying to find methods that break, uh, you know, you, you learn, machine learns something and they try to break what you've learned. Um, are there like, you know, what's, what's going on kind of in that field uh, about sort of being prepared for adversarial attacks? Yeah, that's, those, that's a very interesting question. So just like for everyone, so an adversarial attack essentially means that you essentially uh, exploit knowledge of a, of a given machine learning system. For example, uh, you know, think about an object detector that reads street signs and stop signs, and then to manip manipulate uh, like an input such that the output is actually uh, totally different, right? So, like uh, for example, a an, an stop sign might be interpreted as as a, you know something un irrelevant to a, to a self driving car, and this of course might cause uh, you know catastrophic damage, right? Um, and typically, the way it works is that images are actually manipulated. Uh, in such a way as, for example, you add a tiny bit of noise to that image on top of it, and this will then completely alter the prediction of a classifier. Now, there's a lot of ongoing research on, on how to prevent that, and it usually amounts to changing the network structure in a way such that it's less, uh, less vulnerable to these kind of tiny, tiny changes of the input. Uh, for example, one way to do it would be to add noise, to inject noise into these weights of a neural network and train it in such a way that the neural network becomes robust to certain adversarial attacks, right? But there's much, much more going on, but this would be only one way and actually also connects to this Bayesian deep learning direction that I highlighted earlier in, in my talk. All right, thank you. Uh, so I think I'm gonna try to combine sort of the next two questions because they're somewhat related. Um, so, so one is, so the panelists can argue uh, from their various departments perspective, um, you know, if I wanna be an ICS major, uh, you know, should I major in data science or, or one of the other uh, sort of field, it's, you know, departments that uh, sort of edges on uh, data, right? So computer science or informatics, so they should, is data science the right thing for me? Um, and then the second question is, uh, you know, sort of listening uh, to some of the rocket science and reacting going, okay, I'm feeling inadequate, um, you know, what do I need to do to become a data scientist? And, and you know, is what I can learn here uh, in the data science classes, is that enough to, to get an internship and be successful? So I guess I'll, let, I'll open that up to anyone who would like to, maybe I'll start with Vladimir, just in his, his former role as the, uh, obviously unbiased about which of those programs uh, <laughs> the answer is, since he ran one of them. 
Uh, thank you, Mike. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll give an honest answer. Uh, of course, I am biased toward our data science degree. It's a great degree. It's a mix of statistics and, and computer science, very, very unique, 50-50. And so, yes, our data science students have uh, good um, outcomes in terms of internships and job placements and so on. Um, but uh, yeah, I would, I would kind of repeat what I said before, you know, basically gets, you know, you need some programming skills, databases, and some data analytics skills, and you can pick it up uh, a little bit without going through the whole data science program. You, you can do a statistics minor, for example. I would also would like to uh, echo uh, Roderick's words about communication. Communication skills for data scientists is a very overlooked concept and, and students pay a price for that. So uh, some of them do emphasize too much computing or too much math. And there's no, it, there's no such a thing as too much computing and too much math in, in a sense, but forgetting about communication actually uh, kills a lot of uh, job prospects initially, at least, and then students have to kind of train themselves from scratch. As a data scientist, if you cannot explain what you have, what you have done to your manager, uh, it's basically useless. You, don't, you, 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 you as well may not even do the work, right? You need to explain what you produce, what, the, what do the results mean? And if you cannot give a presentation or write a short description of what you've done, um, th that's, that's very hard. And that kind of distinguishes data science jobs from some of the other engineering jobs where maybe the communication skills are less critical and you maybe can get away with less communication skills, but I don't believe you can get away without communication skills in data science. So please don't ignore them. It will bite you back eventually. All right, others thoughts on uh, degrees? So I have some thoughts on internships. So, I mean, I, I realized that sort of getting the first internship can sometimes be incredibly difficult, right? Especially if you don't have like any personal connections. And so, uh, I mean, this actually both applies to undergraduate internships, but also to PhD level internships, right? So PhD students also do internships sometimes. And um, what I oftentimes observed is that you can actually sort of don't think too late about them and, and maybe also think about upgrading your internships from year to year. So for example, if you do a, like an internship at, in year two at maybe a not such a well-known company, uh, you know, the, the next company will will actually uh, value this this first prior internship experience very highly, right? And then you can actually get a better internship the next year. So this is actually how it oftentimes works, I feel, right? And and a lot of students think about internships as uh, maybe too late, and maybe we could even do a better job at, at reminding them also as faculty. But uh, but yeah, don't don't uh, yeah think about like if you if you didn't don't get into Google in the first year, you know, maybe think more, apply more broadly and try to sort of increase. The, the reputation of your of your employers over time. All right. Others thoughts on uh, degree choice for the students. How do they decide what they want to be when they leave our campus? I don't know, Roderick or Jing, do you have any thoughts on uh, advice for degrees? Uh, we have a few degrees in uh, informatics, but I don't know if any of them are suited specifically for people who want to do data science. So uh, we look for uh, people who have sort of multiple skill sets. So we would definitely want people who have some kind of data skill set, but careers in informatics generally incorporate some other capacity as well. But uh, I don't, we don't have a data science degree specifically in informatics. We have game studies degrees. I think another thing that's kind of interesting is that a lot of the degrees that we have now, those degrees seem increasingly datafied as well. So for example, there's a lot of jobs in game studios for data scientists. So uh, I think that is a sort of a kind of interesting crossover, but there's not a specific data-centered undergraduate degree in informatics, but I am seeing a lot of applicants for uh, doctoral degrees or graduate work, people who did data science work and are now interested mm -hmm. in thinking about the societal consequences of the work they did. And so those would be the kind of students I get as uh, graduate doctoral students. And then maybe with respect to like health, health applications or medical applications, do you have a thought on which kind of degree might be, or, or how you would, what would be your path if you had one degree or the other? Yeah, let me share some of my, like the experience in, for instance, uh, health re related or like the data science degrees. So that's uh, probably an area that there is some terminology barrier to, to enter, right? You, like, uh, I think uh, on top of the general track, like data science courses, uh, for instance, data science, data structure, and some machine learning, AI, that type of courses. I think probably to enter that area, there needs to be some 
like a interprocessor, for instance, like a computational, like a biology, computational genomics, and it's more of a terminology thing. So after you get used to, to this terminology, so, and then you look into the problem itself, it's not that much difference with other like AI application, like computer vision, natural language processing. And uh, we do provide some, some of these classes to get our students used to these terminologies and to introduce the basic knowledge about uh, bioinformatics or like computational biology to, to prepare them to apply their data science skills in this area. All right, thanks. Um, let's see, so one other thing that, um, we don't have any sort of new questions coming in, but something I was wondering about is, is, is you look at what's happening kind of in the world around us, right? We have, uh, you know, sort of floods and fires and sort of, it's very clear, right? That that uh, climate science and climate change and things are, are a very big deal. Uh, and so one of our panelists actually just got a large grant related to that, Stefan, uh, congratulations. And we thought maybe I'd ask you to talk a little bit about that, but maybe also, you know, others of you, what your views are of how uh, sort of the data can be used to help kind of, uh, you know, sort of make it clear that this is real, right? And, and look for solutions uh, and, you know, probably even look at sort of impacts, like, so there are communities in, uh, you know, Louisiana that are very hard hit. Uh, so the sort of the whole social, how can, how can uh, data science and, and sort of informatics be brought to bear on that? So your thoughts on kind of the, the sort of the changing world that we're in and how, how we can help, uh, maybe starting with Stefan, you can talk a little bit about what you're, uh, what you're going to be up to. Yeah, how thanks. Spend, how do you spend your millions, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Thanks. Yeah, we, we recently won a, a huge grant, uh, $3.5 million split across three university campuses. So UC Irvine got a, a third of it. Then we had UC San Diego and Columbia University. And uh, what's really nice about this grant is that it is truly interdisciplinary. So it supports research at the boundary between climate science and machine learning. And as you know, somebody of many of you might know, these interdisciplinary research projects are sometimes the hardest ones to carry out because you know you speak two different languages. If you're paired with a domain expert, you have to understand their language and they don't understand your language. And it takes quite a bit of time to produce kind of the first results. Um, but if, if you manage to do that, then oftentimes these results are kind of the most impactful ones, right? So what I'm particularly excited about it is that this is really about research in machine learning. So we advance the state of the art in machine learning, but make it useful in climate science. And among the things that we are, for example, trying to do is to do um, you know, anomaly detection, as I talk, talked about earlier, um, in particular, looking at uh, climate simulation data. So it turns out that climate scientists are able to simulate, um, you know, create massive amounts of data, uh, of different weather patterns and their geographical locations. And now you can compare uh, these weather patterns at, at, uh, at our current temperature level, but then also like three, uh, three Kelvin or three uh, degrees Celsius uh, at a globally warmer climate. And then essentially these anomaly detection methods will tell you, for example, what, what, what would have been an anomaly today, but what would become the no new normal in the, the future at a, at, a, at a hotter global temperature, right? And in particular, where do these patterns occur? Uh, are there maybe patterns that we're not even aware of because we have never really analyzed these complicated uh, dynamical effects? Uh, do they occur in special geographic locations that we haven't kind of paid enough attention to and, and questions like that? Yeah, so I think that's very exciting and, uh, and I, I really look forward to, um, to collaborating on that with, with the main experts here at, Colum at Columbia University and here at, at UCI. Very cool. Others thoughts on uh, applications of, of what we do to, to climate? All right. I see Vladimir looking thoughtful. I wasn't sure if he was. I, I just was, was thinking that it's too bad that we don't have uh, Warwick Smith or someone like him who is yes. also involved with the earth science researchers uh, have, have been involved uh, for some time uh, on some of these physical collaborations with physical science scientists. Yep. Hopefully this new building that we have, which is uh, designed to specifically enrich those collaborations will bring right. even more of such initiatives to fruition. Yes. All right. Well, I've just gotten the message that uh, uh, some people have to leave for classes, and so we should probably wrap up. Uh, but I would like to uh, thank all of you uh, for participating and turn it back over to our organizers and let them close out the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professors uh, Carrie Mott, 
uh, Crooks, Zhang, and Manon, you guys did a phenomenal job speaking. Um, Emily, if we could pull up the PowerPoint slide for the last couple of slides, that would be great. So now I would like to direct the ICS students to the dedicated recruitment sessions uh, that they RSVP to uh, prior to today. Uh, please follow the recruitment session links that were sent out yesterday. And in closing, uh, on behalf of the Donald Brennan School of Information and Computer Sciences, I'd like to say thank you, not only to the, the faculty speakers and uh, Professor Carey and Dean Marios that spoke, uh, you guys, everybody did a great job. In addition to the corporate partners, the industry attendees, and of course our ICS students. And in closing, I wanted to say we could not be here today without your support and your partnerships as our school continues to grow and become one of the largest academic uh, computer science programs in North America. So thank you everybody for attending and in addition to the great uh, speakers and the dialogue and the panel discussion. Have a great rest of the day.